Hey, good morning, church. So we only have two more weeks left in our journey through Ezra. So we're kind of at the end of the book. And typically, kind of when you're working through books in the Bible, generally, when you start heading towards the end, things start getting a lot more practical. They start getting a little bit lighter. That's certainly the case kind of in New Testament letters. Well, that is not the case today. So Ezra just ends on a really heavy note, as, as Dave has described already this morning. Uh, so it's, it's really hard for us, not hard to understand, it's nothing too complicated, but really difficult to hear and to live out and practice in our lives. So let's get into it. Turn with me to Ezra chapter 9. And just while you're getting there, I just want to give you a heads up on kind of where we'll head today and next week. So Ezra 9 and 10 is pretty much one event. It's one story. So today we're going to read Ezra chapter 9. I'll spend most of my time in chapter 9 and kind of comment a little bit in, on chapter 10. And, and next week we'll actually probably spend most of our time in chapter 9 um, as well. Uh, something really important to talk about. It couldn't fit it all in today. So uh, Ezra chapter 9, let's read together verses 1 through all the way to the end, uh, 15 verses. So after these things had been done, the officials approached me, this is Ezra, and they said, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands with their abominations, from the Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Jebusites, Ammonites, Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken some of their daughters to be wives for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy race has mixed itself with the peoples of the lands. And in this faithlessness... The hand of the officials and chief men has been foremost. As soon as I heard this, I tore my garment and my cloak and I pulled hair from my head and beard and sat appalled. Then all who trembled at the words of the God of Israel, because of the faithlessness of the returned exiles, they gathered around me while I sat appalled until the evening sacrifice. And at the evening sacrifice, I rose from my fasting with my garment and my cloak torn, and I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands to the Lord my God, saying, O oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift my face to you, my God, for our inequities have risen higher than our heads and our guilt has mounted up to the heavens. From the days of our fathers to this day, we have been in great guilt. And for our iniquities, we, our kings and our priests, have been given into the hand of the kings of the lands, to the sword, to captivity, to plundering, and to utter shame as it is today. But now for a brief moment, favor has been shown by the Lord our God to leave us a remnant and to give us a secure hold within his holy place that our God may brighten our eyes and grant us a little reviving in our slavery. For we are slaves. Yet our God has not forsaken us in our slavery. He has extended to us his steadfast love before the kings of Persia to grant us some reviving, to set up the house of our God, to repair its ruins, and to give us protection in Judea and Jerusalem. And now, O our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken your commandments, those which you commanded by your servants, the prophets, saying, the land that you are entering to take possession of it is a land impure with the impurity of the peoples of the lands, with their abominations that have filled it from end to end with their uncleanness. Therefore, do not take 
your daughters to their sons, neither take their daughters for your sons, and never seek their peace or prosperity, that you may be strong and eat the good of the land and leave it for an inheritance to your children forever. And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great guilt, seeing that you, our God, have punished us less than our iniquities deserved and have given us such a remnant, such an opportunity such as this, shall we break your commandments again and intermarry with the people who practice these abominations? Would you not be angry with us until you consumed us so that there should be no longer a remnant nor any to escape. O Lord, the God of Israel, you are just, for you are left a remnant that has escaped as it is today. Behold, we are before you in our guilt, for none can stand before you because of this. So here's what's happening. Ezra has just arrived on the scene. He's only been there a couple of months. He's come with the second wave of exiles. And some of the community leaders come to Ezra and they tell him that some of the other exiles living in Jerusalem, so those that had come previously uh, with Zerubbabel, that they had intermarried with the people living in the land, intermarried with non-Jewish people from the nations surrounding them, which was something expressly forbidden by God. So Ezra kind of quotes that law, that commandment. I want to read it to you from Deuteronomy, this commandment that God gives them. This is before they even enter the promised land, the Israelites, he gives them this command. And he's very clear about this. He says, when the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are entering to take possession of it, when he clears away the many nations before you, the Hittites, Gergeshites, Amazites, Canaanites, Perizzites, all the other ites, seven nations more numerous and mightier than you, when the Lord gives them over to you, you and you defeat them, you must devote them to complete destruction. You shall make no covenant with them, show no mercy to them. You shall not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons, for they would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods." And then the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you and he would destroy you quickly. But this is how you should deal with them. Break down their altars to false gods, dash in pieces their pillars, chop down their asherim, burn their carved images with fire, for you are a people holy to the Lord your God. He is very clear that God is going to be angry if you marry people from the surrounding nations whose land you're about to occupy. So this news comes to Ezra that this is exactly what's happening, and he's devastated. The word used in Ezra 9 is he is appalled. He's, he's literally kind of shaking. He's pulling out his hair and his beard. He's so grieved by this, which at first is very difficult for us to hear, mainly because it sounds like God is very against you marrying somebody from an ethnic group different to you. Or even worse, perhaps a huge stumbling block for people approaching this chapter is it kind of smacks a little of ethnic superiority. And actually, this is the easiest part of the sermon because you can very quickly see that this has nothing to do with race but has everything to do with religion. So in that Deuteronomy verse it says you shall not intermarry for they will turn you from following me. That's the threat is that their religion will be compromised and in Ezra 9 it's clear as well. Uh, verse 1 the people of of Israel, the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands with their abominations. And when abomination comes up two more times in this chapter, it literally refers to little idols, things that represented the false pagan gods 
of that the people of the surrounding nations worshipped. In other words, what it's saying is the people are in danger through marrying those who worship those abominations, those false gods. They are in danger of themselves worshipping them. So this commandment and this great event that has come before Ezra, the sin of the people, is not about race. It is about religion. See, God has drawn these people, I mean, going way back, the Hebrew people, out of slavery in Egypt. He has consecrated them at Mount Sinai, dedicated them as a people of His own. He has created this covenant with them, given them very specific instructions on how to live as people who belong to Him. And as they move into the promised land, occupied by people who worship other gods, the threat, the danger is that if they intermarry, that their own faith, their identity as the people of the Holy God would be compromised, diluted, or even destroyed, and they may end up even apostatizing, turning from worship of God to worship other gods. In other words, the reason this moment, there's such a dramatic response from Ezra, is because God's great plan of redemption, this redemptive historical plan, is under threat at this moment. One of the greatest threats to God's plan of salvation is intermarriage through people that worship other gods. And you might go, man, surely that's not the greatest threat. There must be other threats like the people's stubbornness or like the surrounding nations at war. With them. No, this is the greatest threat to the God's redemptive plan. Their faith being compromised, destroyed through integrating with people who worship other gods. And I want to I want to just show you just how vulnerable this moment is, just how much they were on the hinge of this great plan of salvation falling away. I want to describe that to you by telling you a little bit about another community of Jewish people living at the same time in a place called Elephantani. Right, Elephantani. You get some, it's a real place in Egypt, on the border of Egypt. Uh, it's, you spell it elephant with an I-N-E on the end. You can go look it up. Not to be confused with elephantine, which means to be like an elephant, large or clumsy. It's not, it's not that. Elephantani is this place in Egypt. And, and here's the story. So when the Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar come and they destroy Jerusalem, and take the exiles. Remember, they took most of the people living in the southern kingdom of Judah, took them into exile in Babylon. That's the, where this whole story of Ezra starts, and Daniel and others are in exile in Babylon. Most of them go to Babylon. Some are left behind in Jerusalem. Of the group that stays in Jerusalem, a, 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 a subset of them, a group of them decide, man, we, we figure our chances are better living in Egypt than here in Jerusalem under Babylonian rule. And so they actually migrate to this elephantine region in Egypt. And it, there's a whole story there, uh, which we don't have time to get into, but they drag Jeremiah the prophet with them, and he actually goes and lives in elephantine in Egypt with them. So basically there's three groups of Jewish people living at this time of exile. There's those in Babylon, there's those left behind in Jerusalem, and there's this little Jewish group living in Egypt at the time. Now, we know a lot about this Jewish community living in Elephantine. Archaeological records, you can go and Google this, the Elephantine papyri, describe detail about what this Jewish community looked like. It's just so fascinating, the archaeological records that we have around this whole time period. We've spoken about Cyrus Cylinder and now these papyri. So here's this Jewish group living now in Egypt. Here's some of the things we know about what they did and how they lived. Firstly, we know that they widely intermarried 
with the people living around them in Egypt. Like there's marriage documents in these papyri. They're widely intermarried. We know that all of a sudden then, they started worshipping not only God, Yahweh, their God, all of a sudden they started worshipping other gods. They became polytheistic almost immediately. Started worshipping God and other gods. In fact, they even invented a new god called Anath Yahweh, a double-barreled name. They're like, hey, we've got our god Yahweh and there's these other gods. Let's just join them together. Let's just create a new god. Like there's records of them creating this new god that they were now going to worship. We know that the Torah, the Bible that was available at that time, disappears from all their records. They had no longer have the word of God anymore. In fact, they even, and it's just fascinating, as I mentioned to you two weeks ago, Ezra, the scribe, is in Babylon, and he's memorizing the Torah. He's memorized the whole thing. These guys lose it. They just like, forget about it. It gets lost. And they start to create their own religious texts. So we have those documents. And in their new religious texts, there is no mention whatsoever of the Exodus of Moses, of Abraham, of David, of the prophets, like these major figures in this story, in their story, in their history, in their journey with God, just like disappear, never comes up. It's crazy what happens to the Jewish community living in Elephantani. Their entire religious system, their faith, collapses. It's erased from their history. Just like that, all of a sudden, because of intermarrying with the people who worshipped other gods living around them. So Ezra knows this danger. He knows it because of God's commands. He's seen that the kingdom was actually separated north and south under King Solomon because of this. And Ezra somehow knows that at this particular moment, in God's redemptive plan, they are vulnerable. And God's plan is under great threat because of what's happening. Hence, Ezra's dramatic response. And we're going to go next week, just really look at Ezra's prayer. There's so much fascinating about his prayer. But I really feel today we need to come step back and, and already start to apply this. Because there's at least one very obvious practical application that we have to make closely associated with what's happening here, and then a wider application that I want to make as well, related to the heart of this danger. This danger of your faith being diluted, compromised, or at worst, destroyed. So the very close, obvious application is that we have to talk about dating or marrying someone who's not a Christian, right? So this intermarriage story is, is not about marrying people of other races or ethnic groups, but who worship other gods. And so we have to talk about this, the danger of dating or marrying, as a Christian, dating or marrying someone who's not a Christian, which is really hard to hear if I just kind of backtrack in my own story, I mean, as I was a Christian and getting serious as a Christian and was in, in love with a girl who was not a Christian and just I, I knew that this was kind of generally the church's stance on this, that it was unwise to do this and just was so hard at the time. But the danger in Ezra 9 is still a danger today. That danger of through marriage, 
your faith being diluted, compromised, or at worst, destroyed through covenanting in marriage with someone who doesn't believe what you do as a Christian. Now, before I get into that, let's just say that, of course, the difference between this moment in Ezra 9 and our moment now today, and we always need to talk about these differences when we're translating from the Old Testament to the New Testament. The difference is in Ezra 9, God's redemptive plan was under great threat. Now, through Jesus, that redemptive plan has been accomplished. But it's done. Anybody who places their faith and believes in Jesus is saved. The redemptive plan of, that was ultimately going to culminate in Jesus has happened and we rejoice and glorify in that. The redemptive plan is not under threat, but your faith, your devotion, your worship as an individual is still under threat. through being in covenant with somebody who doesn't believe the same things that you do. And that's why in the New Testament, there still is a lot of talk about this. So, for example, one of the classic passages that I knew way back then that I really struggled with was this one from 2 Corinthians 6 verse 14, which says, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Which, by the way, actually talks very generally. It's not actually specifically a passage about marriage, but of course it includes marriage. But it talks about so much, perhaps business partnerships and, and, and other things. There is an extreme danger for a Christian contemplating dating or marrying a non-Christian. And, and I just want to kind of talk pastorally a little bit about this without going into the detail of these verses and other ones like 1 Corinthians 7 verse 39 and, and others. Let me just talk pastorally about why it would be so unwise. Firstly, <laughs> marriage is hard enough already without introducing the difficulty of being in a life partnership with someone who doesn't have this same worldview with you. It's hard enough as it is. And in fact, this idea of unequally yoked, I think some of you have been around church for a while, know this metaphor well, but if you're kind of new, you think, what does that mean? Kind of a farming metaphor of two oxen that would have this you know, wooden yoke on them and they would pull a plow. And the idea of unequally yoked is, is the idea of maybe like a large ox being yoked to, connected to like a small donkey in order to do some work. And if you think about it, the two animals are very different sizes, very different strength, very different kind of walking speed. So picture that. You're supposed to picture this metaphor. It's like it's just what was supposed to harness the strength of both. That's what the yoke is, harness the strength of both. It's not harnessing the strength anymore. Like both animals, they're getting rubbed against each other like nothing is being accomplished. Instead of harnessing the strength of both, instead there's this great disruption and a rubbing and a chafing and it it's just describing difficulty it ends up instead of great teamwork being really difficult and listen to this for both parties not just for you as the christian it may be really hard for the non-Christian, you're considering marrying as hard for them. It may not be the most loving thing for them. Not just for you. Because that's how difficult it is likely to be. Second comment I want to make is that in order for things to really work, just talking about the practicalities of family life, in order for this to work, the Christian will have to move the things of Christ to the margins of their life. 
you know, just for this to kind of make sense. So it, it may not involve apostatizing, but you'll have to move things to the margins, like how you spend your time in worship and church activities. You may not be able to spend as much time. Issues like tithing, I, I, I can't understand how it would be possible for a Christian and a non-Christian to talk about tithing, how you spend your money. The issue of raising your children and, and raising them in faith with somebody who doesn't believe. Ultimately, those things will have to be pushed to the margins of your life and you won't be able to express the, perhaps the devotion and worship that you want to. In fact, I heard somebody say it's almost like you're spiritually single, although married. And last thing I want to say, for me, the greatest challenge for a Christian marrying a non-Christian is knowing the reality that unless God intervenes in your spouse's life, you're going to spend eternity in different places. This is brutally hard. And that's why there's warnings in Scripture. Whenever we see these warnings and commandments, it's ultimately to protect us. Now, I know for some of you that may be really hard. Maybe it's just a small percentage of those watching, but I just want to acknowledge how hard this might be. In that you really want to be married, and this you, you feel like is your only shot at getting married. It may be really hard for some of you, maybe quite a few of you watching, who find yourselves now married to a non-Christian. You're a Christian and you're already married to a non-Christian. That might be because you were both non-Christians and you became when you got married and now you became a Christian. Or you were both Christians when you got married, but now one is no longer practicing Christianity. Or maybe you just didn't even know this when you got married. Now what do you do? Because if you read in Ezra 9, and if you go on to read Ezra 10, that's why I have to mention Ezra 10 today, you'll see that what the people recommend doing, they come to Ezra and go, we think what we need to do is divorce all of our foreign wives. We need to divorce them. And so actually Ezra 10 is this whole ceremony of Ezra presiding over the people divorcing themselves out of these marriages. So if you had to read that, you would go, so what must I do? Am I supposed to divorce my non-believing spouse? And the answer is, do not do that. Don't do that. And the New Testament, again, is just very clear about this. Paul talks particularly about it. What to do if you find yourself in this situation that, that might be a few of you. So, for example, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 13 to 14, speaking exactly about this. Paul says, if any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, so there's an arrangement that we can, we can make this work, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband, listen to this, great encouragement to those who find themselves already in this situation. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. And Peter talks about this as well, the opportunity for your faith to rub off, as it were, on your spouse. Which brings up another tricky question, and I have to deal with these questions. I feel like if you're just reading through Ezra, these could be huge stumbling blocks to you. That's why I almost need two weeks to deal with this chapter. Because the next question is, but okay, so in the New Testament, Paul's saying, don't divorce in this situation. But in Ezra 10, that's exactly what they did. Why is there this disparity then? And that's kind of a big question with a really long answer. But the short version of that answer is this. There's a lot that develops in the idea of marriage from the Old Testament to the New Testament. There's lots of things that develop. There's lots of things that grow a lot lighter for us. Restrictions and commandments that fall away. And generally we look at those and we're super happy. For example that you may not eat pork. We go, now we can eat pork, I can eat bacon. Yeah, and we get, we get excited about the, the development of themes and things that fall away. But there are some things that don't get lighter, they get tighter. Marriage is certainly one of them. As you trace marriage from Old Testament to New Testament, things get a lot tighter. That's why you see polygamy in the Old Testament, but not in the New Testament. 
a lot about it gets tighter from old to new. That's part of the answer here. Part of it is because the particular moment of redemptive history that Ezra stood in and the threat of God's plan of salvation. So that's kind of the obvious application we had to talk about. It wasn't about race, but religion. So what about marrying somebody with different religious beliefs? But there's a wider application that I want to make and close with today. Because today I believe that the danger of compromising our Christian faith, that danger is not restricted to marrying somebody who believes something different to us. In fact, I think there's a greater chance of our faith being diluted, compromised, and even destroyed through intermarrying, integrating with secular culture around us. So the 2015 census the government took of South Africa, the report was that 86% of South Africans call themselves Christian. And then there's other religions. Only 5% of our country say they are a-religious. They don't have any religious beliefs, at at least back then. 86% of our country call themselves Christian. And we've got to ask, man, if that were true, surely we'd be living in a different country. It's just very clear that those who call themselves Christian, the majority, don't live as Christians. And this is not something unique to South Africa and not unique to history. Through the history of the church, this blending of the world and secular culture with the church, instead of the church remaining distinct, has plagued the church for centuries. I mean, let's be honest, it's widely known statistically throughout the world that there's almost no difference practically between the way Christians live and the way non-Christians live. Divorce rates are almost the same. Issues of premarital sex, pornography, domestic violence, almost the same statistics in so-called Christian homes and non-Christian homes. Those who call themselves Christians are just as likely to hold racist views as non-Christians. We suffer as Christians from materialism, from radical individualism, from selfish ambition just as much as anybody else. We today are in danger of elephantani. Remember that word. It's It's a word that can stick in your mind. Elephantani. We are in danger of elephantani today, not through intermarriage specifically, but generally by not holding on to our distinctive identity as Christians and integrating the way we practice our lives with the way the world around us practices their lives. There's a very real threat today for us. Now, I've said this to you before. This will be my first intentional repeat. And let me just tell you, I'll probably repeat it five more times before the end of the year even. This idea of when it comes to how the world sees Christians. I love this idea that when the world thinks about Christians, they should be very confused and very conflicted about what they think about us. Because on the one hand, when the world thinks about Christians, the fact that we do so much good, right, that they, they should really want to have us around uh, because of our love for our neighbors, because of our care and compassion for the poor and the marginalized, because of our courageous efforts at standing up to injustices and combating oppression. We are the best workers in our companies. We are the most helpful neighbors in our neighborhoods. We are the most generous tippers in restaurants. We start schools and hospitals and nonprofit organizations. We love Christians, the world should say. You are such a blessing to our communities and to our lives, on the one hand. 
But on the other hand, we live so differently to the way they do that it causes offense because we have such distinct lives, such sharp views on how we should live that rub against secular culture. We don't talk like they do. We don't get drunk like they do. We don't sleep around like the non-Christian world do. We don't participate in the same forms of entertainment. We refuse to engage in unethical business practices like they do. And that makes them feel judged and threatened and offended and angry. So on the one hand, we love Christians. On the other hand, we can't stand them. Exactly. It's exactly how the world, when they think about Christians, they should be very conflicted about what to think. We're not just these separatists who stand on the side and judge and condemn. We're also such a source of blessing. But we're also just not just these really nice people who live lives exactly the way that they do. This is... I think, a blueprint for our Christian lives. And for me, a blueprint for a church. A church like Rosebank, like what's our role? To be this incredible challenge, a channel of blessing that Joburg is so grateful Rosebank is here. But on the other hand, we are just so radically different. And I want to let you in on a little secret. I'll close with this. This the hard part of that conundrum, our distinctiveness, is actually in itself a blessing. It's what a watching world needs. They don't, may not know it, but it's what they need. It's what could lead to their redemption. Jesus says it like this. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses... It's saltiness. Lose your distinctiveness. If it loses its saltiness, well then, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything. So in fact, remaining distinct and separate in the way that we live is not just to protect ourselves and our faith on its own. It's also salty and is redemptive to a world around us. So let's pray and let's ask God, let's invite the Holy Spirit to challenge us this morning that we would live this kind of life. So pray with me. And maybe I want to do just what Dave did, just as, as we're in this moment of prayer, start with just a moment of silence. To allow God to stir up in our hearts for the Holy Spirit to convict us of ways that we live that are not distinctive. where we've integrated our lives with secular culture and where perhaps we need to take a step back again and cut those connections. God, would you show us? Holy Spirit, show us. We feel the weight of these words today. And Holy Spirit, we so desperately want to be salt and light in the darkness. So convict us, bring about transformation. Such a bold prayer. And make us people of the light. And God, I pray just for those, especially in that particular situation of dating or marriage, for those perhaps single and longing for a spouse. For those perhaps in early stages of those relationships and conflicted. 
God, would your peace, would you speak wisdom into their lives, bring great peace. For those in marriages where this is so difficult, I pray for peace as well, God, and for you to redeem, as we see in scriptures, the opportunity for an unbelieving spouse to come to know you just purely through the witness of a believing spouse. God, I pray that. We pray that for our brothers and sisters in our church, in our community. Your gospel to shine and bring great peace in those homes as well. Holy Spirit, we entrust ourselves and trust this church to you. Mold us and shape us. Use us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.